little bit under the weather, so I'm not going to shake your hand okay. at the end. Sorry. All right, good afternoon, everyone. We are ready to get started. Thank you all so much for being here. If you could all take a seat, that would be great. Uh, my name is Edward Wulcher. I am the curator of lectures at Town Hall Seattle, and I am so happy to welcome you to our Seattle Meet the Candidates, our community forum with uh, candidates for all four citywide elections this year in Seattle. Uh, this is a big event <laughs> that came together with a number of co-sponsors, so let me thank them. In particular, the lead sponsor on today's event, the City of Seattle's Democracy Voucher Program. The Democracy Voucher Program, I hope you are all aware of. There's information about them downstairs, but this is a really radical and national significant uh, effort that the city of Seattle has done to make our campaigns more equitable and accessible. Uh, it was passed by voters a few years ago and it is coming into being now this year. So please take the time today to learn more about that program uh, with the information at the table downstairs. Other sponsors today include uh, Town Hall Seattle, the organization I represent, the Municipal League of King County, the Washington Bus, the Seattle Public Library, and the Rainier Beach Action Coalition. Uh, finally, I would like to thank Rainer uh, Arts Center, the space we are in tonight, and Seed Arts, the organization that manages it. This is a beautiful space. Uh, Town Hall is using it extensively to present a program of lectures and community forums down in this space while our own building is closed for renovations. Uh, please keep an eye on everything that's happening here. The folks from Rainer Arts Center also asked that I make a special shout out for a program they're doing next week. Uh, as I'm sure we are all overwhelmed with civic engagement right now, this is a really great opportunity right in time for Diwali to celebrate some arts and culture with Arts Gumbo, celebrating Indian and South Asian arts in the space uh, next weekend, uh, October 19th through the 21st. There will be film screenings, dance events. Uh, it's a really cool uh, program that they host every year in this space, celebrating a different cultural component of the South End. So please take a look at that. There's flyers for it on the way out and everything else happening here. Okay, a couple things about this forum. First of all, I want to give special thanks to all the interpreters who are in the space tonight. The sign language interpreters who are over here, thank you all so much. If you're in need of that, please come sit in this area. I will also say that if you have friends who could use who um, use sign language interpretation who weren't able to make it tonight, Town Hall is producing a video of this program with an embedded sign language interpretation window. So there will be an opportunity to hear from the candidates. And all of our simultaneous translators who are in the, in the the room tonight who I'd like to call up to the front of the stage really quickly to say hello, introduce themselves, and say their names. Thank you. Yeah.
Okay, thank you all so much. And thank you so much um, for everyone in this room for participating in this forum. And especially thank you to all the candidates and the staff. There are so many of these this fall. It feels like we're living in this, such a strange political times. And this is a particularly uh, dramatic uh, year in local politics. So I'd actually like to give just a round of applause to all of the partners, everyone here, and particularly the candidates for this marathon of an election season. <laughs> um, but. I've spoken to many people for whom this is their first forum or the main thing that they're using to make up their minds in this election. As I said, there will be video with embedded ASL. Thank you to Seattle Channel who is pro are producing the video today. Uh, so please share this uh, far and wide to help um, expand consciousness and civic engagement around our wild election year. I have one more person to thank before we move on to our program, and that is our moderator tonight, Enrique Serna. Uh, Enrique has served on KCTS public television for over 20 years. He anchored current affairs programs, moderated statewide political debates, produced and reported stories for national PBS programs, in addition to local documentaries on social and juvenile justice, the environment, and Latinos in Washington State. He is a veteran of these forums, and we thank him so much for doing it. And then, Enrique, before I turn it to you, I actually should say one last thing about the format tonight. So we are actually treating each race indiv individually, giving it its due. Um, some of these forums have like all eight candidates on stage, and it's a little bit hard to tell the signal from the noise. So we're beginning with our city attorney candidates. Thank you so much for being on stage already. Then we'll be doing each of the two citywide city council races, and then our mayoral candidates will bring up the rear. There are Q&A cards that have been passed out around the room. Thank you to our friends at the library who are doing those. If you still have those that you'd like to turn in or would like to grab one, please do. Um, you have an opportunity to fill out one of those cards and, and hand it in before the end of, uh, of each section to ask questions for the candidates in the later sections. And there's no on-microphone Q&A tonight. Uh, sorry, Alex, <laughs> uh, the, uh, please don't. Uh, uh, that's. So please don't interrupt the forum or we'll, you'll be asked to leave if... So, um, so <laughs> I'm just, that's the, the choice for this forum. There's other opportunities at other forums if you'd like to stick around afterwards and, and chat. But I, I will say that from this point forward, if you interrupt the program, we're going to have to ask folks to leave. We'll gather those questions after this. Thank you. Okay, I understand that. Uh, thank you. Um, so with all, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the program. I'm going to be sitting here in the front timing the candidates, so we will try and keep things on time today. And uh, again, thank you so much for being here. Enrique Serena, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, and here we go. Uh, thank you all for being here today. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a very nice day here in Seattle. So for you to give your time here to listen to the candidates, it's very much appreciated. As you know, the Democracy Voucher Program is a new way for Seattle residents who have not been involved in the political process to participate. And the uh, majority, 99% of the questions that are you going to be uh, asked uh, today of the candidates are coming from you, the public, the residents of Seattle. So we appreciate that you have been involved here. Those questions have come from an online survey, video submissions, also written questions from the audience in attendance uh, here today. Now the uh, candidates in each race will be on stage for 25 minutes. The candidates will each have 90 seconds uh, to respond to the questions. Um, they will also have an opportunity uh, toward the last five minutes of the, of the uh, time that they are up here to have a two minute closing statement. Uh, we'll kind of do that in an alphabetical order. I'll figure that out and you guys will just go with it, okay? Uh, and uh, we will start with the race for a city attorney and please welcome the, uh, the candidates. The incumbent is Pete Holmes and his challenger is Scott Lindsay. Please welcome them, give them a round of applause. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Um, first of all, uh, questions uh, that have come in, and they start with this. Will you equitably enforce anti-public marijuana smoking and needle use in our public parks? Right now, there is a serious issue driving families out of parks and off certain shopping areas in the South End, Broadway, U District, Cal Anderson Park, et cetera. What will you do to try to enforce and to make sure that this is not an ongoing issue? Uh, we will begin with Scott Lindsay, the challenger. 
Yeah, I think we do have very genuine public safety challenges in many of our downtown parks in particular. And I've uh, tried to, as for the former public safety advisor to the mayor of Seattle, come up with some innovative programs to help address some of those challenges. One of the first things I was involved in was the creation of the Heroin and Opiate Addiction Task Force. Seattle has an extraordinary challenge right now with the heroin epidemic. We are seeing just a, a lot more people suffering from addiction on the streets of Seattle, and we need to do much better. So that effort brought about 40 individuals from first responders like firefighters and police uh, and police officers to addiction specialists and uh, hospital administrators together. We made recommendations for prevention, treatment, and user health. One of those recommendations was to cite the first pilot supervised consumption site in the city of Seattle. That is a pilot, an experiment, but I think it's an important experiment to see if we can get uh, behavior that's uh, uh, people who are struggling uh, with addiction using in inappropriate places, out of those inappropriate places, off of our sidewalks, out of our parks, out of the Starbucks bathrooms, and inside to a safer, more managed location. I think that's an important innovation, important pilot for us to actually improve both public health and public safety right here in the city of Seattle. Pete Holmes, your response. Uh, Enrique, if I could just make sure I'm clear on the question. You seem like you were asking also about marijuana use as well as needles. The question is, will you equitably enforce anti-public marijuana smoking? as well as a crackdown on needle use in public parks. You bet. Okay, uh, thanks very much for the question. Um, on the marijuana use, I want to answer that uh, more directly. Uh, you know, it is not a crime any longer, although I did stop uh, bringing those racially disproportionate charges for marijuana possession when I, as soon as I took office and then went on to help legalize marijuana under I-502. Now, a possession of marijuana, smoking in public, is uh, it's still against the law, but it's a civil infraction. And you may have heard that our Initially, uh, the uh, SPD stumbled. Uh, they were issuing tickets disproportionately, once again, but all around the Pioneer Square area. Even some of those tickets were addressed to me, P.D. Holmes. So it reflected, uh, you know, some uh, a learning process. And I'm happy to report now that uh, in the in the year since those were dismissed, something like five or six hundred tickets were issued. Exactly four of them dismissed by my office because they are much more equitably distributed across the city. As far as needles, it's important to understand understand that the city attorney uh, does not have VUXA jurisdiction. What we do have, uh, it, any drug crime, if it's a direct drug crime, it's referred to the county. Uh, but what I have done to help with the broader problem is, number one, to file a lawsuit along with Attorney General Bob Ferguson a few weeks ago against the opioid manufacturers. All right, Pete, we're going to move on to the next Bye. question here. Um, as city attorney, what can you do, if anything, to address the problem of the over 40% of homeless people considered to be living unsheltered who live in vehicles? And we'll start with Pete Holmes first on that. We've got 90 seconds. <clears throat> This is one of the, the many dimensions of the unsheltered populations that live in the city of Seattle. And uh, it is a tragedy in our midst. It's also one that exists across the country. We know that uh, it has many origins, many underlying causes. Uh, opioid addiction is one, and I referenced earlier that filing a lawsuit against those manufacturers to help dislodge their profits and help address the addiction treatment, the housing needs and the like are, is one part of the answer. Um, the other is uh, the, uh, the other lawsuit that I was going to refer to is I have joined in the lawsuit that would uh, block I-27 for the siting of these safe injection sites. Uh, that's, uh, that's one of the, uh, I think, many remedies that we have at our disposal and that the city attorney is, is particularly positioned in order to get relief for the city, to help us get some, some real relief uh, from this problem. But what the, city excuse me, what the city attorney is most fundamentally uh, responsible for is to make sure that the city stays on track, that we don't fall back into the old arrest your way out of this problem. Because we know that a fundamentally public health problem cannot be addressed with an arrest, with prosecution, because it does nothing to address the underlying addiction or in the case of a mental illness, if that's one of the problems. And so my office has been resolute that it is no longer the first response with criminal justice. It is a backup, and we are insisting that we go with a public health response. Thank you very much. And Scott Lindsay. 
Yeah, the question here is about people who are living in vehicles. And the challenge that we're facing with 40% of all of the homeless people in Seattle living in vehicles is that in some occasions, not all, but in some occasions, folks are living in vehicles that don't move, aren't able to comply with the basic laws of the city of Seattle. Uh, laws that require that you maintain a street safe vehicle, for example. Laws that require that you be able to move your vehicle every 72 hours. Sometimes that creates real stress for, of course, the individuals living in the vehicle, and it can also create real stress and strain for people who are residents or businesses where a vehicle may be parked out in front for days or weeks. In some cases, there are also inappropriate activity in those vehicles. We've seen a lot of examples of that. Seattle Police Department has intervened in a lot of examples of that. I actually think that the city attorney's office should be front and center in helping to problem solve with both a compassionate response, but a response that actually gets results and helps people along through these tough situation. The city attorney ultimately is responsible for how we enforce how we how we enforce the law of the city of Seattle in the public realm in our public spaces. So I think there's much a lot of room to use the city attorney's office for a platform for creative, compassionate problem solving here. All right. Pete Holmes. I think I started with that, but okay. I, I would... Uh, All right, we'll move on to the next thing, I'm sorry. Let's, we actually have a follow-up uh, on, on that same issue. Um, what do you think of uh, using city resources and to what extent to force people from tent encampments? Actually, we'll begin with Scott, I believe, on this yeah. one. Sorry. So in 2015, 2016, the mayor actually tasked me with reforming the way that the city addressed uh, folks who are living in uh, unauthorized encampments in tents. This is a serious challenge that the city is facing. We have people living in tents, sometimes in very dangerous or unhealthy conditions all across the city. We have some very vulnerable people living in tents all across the city. And immediately it was apparent that the way that we were doing things was not working in any way. It wasn't helping address the safety and health situations for neighborhoods. It wasn't helping ultimately those who were the most vulnerable living outside. So I actually helped spearhead, created and led a couple of things. First, the navigation team. And there was in fact a great news story on Q13 about the navigation team today. That for the first time paired outreach workers with police officers with a non-arrest strategy to actually go out and engage folks who are living in unauthorized encampments to try and find with multiple engagements, multiple outreach, the best solution for them. Real, alternative, meaningful shelter and services. That uh, team has had remarkable success getting people out of some very dangerous situations and into better, safer alternatives. We also created a rule that was a very important rule in April 2017 that said for the first time, the city won't remove people unless it has meaningful, meaningful safer shelter alternatives. I think we got to stick by that. I think that's essential. All right. This is one aspect of the city attorney's job that is sometimes um, when you, you hold your nose when you move forward. Uh, my office, of course, was tasked with uh, defending against the lawsuits against the very program that uh, Mr. Lindsay says he spearheaded. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a challenge. But we have recently been uh, confirmed by the court that we can move forward. We've got a lot of work to do. Uh, I think, frankly, the city had more of, uh, approached this from a beautification project rather than an attempt to actually address the human beings that live in unauthorized encampments in particular. The sweeps were wrong-headed. Uh, and uh, in fact, in order to keep costs down, they used prison labor uh, over our objections until we finally were able to get that stopped. So the city attorney's office does serve as a guide, uh, providing advice, but we are not the executive. We're not the executive, and uh, the notion that, uh, that Mr. Lindsay is going to leave the executive and come to the city attorney's office and, and do more than he was able to accomplish in the last three years on homelessness is, uh, is really uh, puzzling. But the bottom line is the city attorney will be there. This is why we need in this third term this continuity, this stable transition to keep this city moving forward, making progress, even when we make mistakes. Uh, we own those, and I'm here to continue making sure that we go with a public health approach instead of a criminal justice approach. I have another, uh, I want to follow up on this issue of homelessness and sweeps again. Um, the question here is that uh, at 
it would at any point, or can you at any point, intervene against the mayor if the mayor decides to continue to engage in sweeps without providing adequate shelter to those most in need? And I believe, uh, Pete, you start first. Uh, sure. Um, intervention is uh, a, a word that uh, is really used sparingly. A trusted lawyer with experience will, will counsel clients in private, will try to make sure that they see uh, all of the potential implications of a course of action. It's not just the law. It's social, economic, political, and moral. And that's what I have been able to do uh, with, with a great deal of effectiveness. Uh, sometimes, as in the case of the first administration with Mayor McGinn, I had to openly confront on the issue of police reform. And when I had to, I did so. In the case of the, of the cleanups, for instance, in my first term, I had to say, no, I will not issue arrest warrants uh, for people that you have done zero in the, in the nature of outreach with services, with housing. Uh, that's where the city attorney does have to draw the line, but I do so reluctantly. One of the things that has bothered me about this campaign was that on the car camping subject, Mr. Lindsay leaked an early draft of Councilmember O'Brien's car camping ordinance. When we were working with him quietly, trying to identify issues, he had the courage to move forward with it and try to enact legislation, and yet that kind of approach, if you leak something on one of your clients, you're not going to have that confidential relationship and make progress. All right, Scott Lindsay. Of course, Mr. O'Brien wasn't my client, and he had distributed that, uh, that legislation widely to a large group of outside stakeholders. And I did make it public because I was very involved in RV car camping, trying to make for a better compassionate solution, trying to set up the RV car camping lots, but also uh, thought that Mr. O'Brien's direction in that case was very wrong-headed, that it would be more expensive and wouldn't get us the results that we want. Here's the challenge, right? And, and I think we're discussing what is the fundamental role of the city attorney's office. So in several years that I worked on many of the toughest challenge, challenges in the city of Seattle, downtown public safety, the heroin and opiate addiction crisis, homelessness, the issue of unauthorized encampments, the city attorney's office so often was missing in action. Mr. Holmes just described the city attorney's office as being uh, that they should be involved in counseling their clients from the outset. Well, nobody from the city attorney's office, and that's almost 200 attorneys and staff, a $30 million budget, nobody from the city attorney's office came out to see what was actually going on going on on the streets with the way that the city was addressing unauthorized encampments until they hired a private outside law firm. <laughs> very expensive, very successful private outside law firm. Those folks, they wanted to see what was going on because they know to advise their client they have to see what's going out on the street. That's the kind of on the ground, hands-on activist city attorney that I think we need in the city of Seattle right now. All right, thank you very much. Uh, do you view the city attorney role as proactivist or, or excuse me, as proactive or activist? And let's start, let's start with Scott Lindsay. Proactive or activist? Well, I would say both. And I think there's a, there is a significant philosophical difference here. So the city attorney has, as I said, 200 attorneys and staff, a $30 million budget, vast resources, unfettered discretion in how to prosecute and enforce all misdemeanor crimes in the city of Seattle. That's almost 15,000 reports that come to the city attorney's office every year and, uh, and can have a vast influence in problem solving for many of our toughest challenges. I think the city attorney should serve all 700,000 residents of the city of Seattle, not just be the contract attorney for the nine council members in one mayor. I think that's viewing the city attorney in a too narrow a fashion. I think it has a, a much more expansive, broad role, and it should be hands-on engaged in all of these tough challenges. Ultimately, when we talk about unauthorized encampments, when we talk about the opioid epidemic, when we talk about homelessness, when we talk about street disorder, we are talking about issues uh, uh, that relate to enforcement of the laws of the city of Seattle in the public realm. So the city attorney should be there to find a compassionate, smart, effective, results-based public response. That's the role of the city attorney. All right, good hopes. 
You know, Enrique, could you remind me of the question again? Okay. What I asked is, do you view the city attorney's role as proactive or as activist? And I think this is one area that we agree. I'm not sure of the difference, actually, between proactive and an activist, but I would say safely I've done both. Uh, look at my record. You can hear lots of uh, vague promises and general plans here, uh, along with some inaccurate data along the way. I wish I had 200 lawyers and professionals. Uh, we have 102 lawyers and about 80 legal professionals that uh, do this work. 26 of those are prosecutors to deal with those 14,000 and some crimes that are referred to us uh, every year. But uh, what I would say is that uh, look at my record on police reform. Look at my record on criminal justice reform. Look at my record on drug policy reform. When we came to office, we made sure that citizen and non-citizen treat, were treated alike in sentencing so that you wouldn't face the risk of mandatory deportation. That took a lot of courage because there was incredible blowback from uh, the municipal court, from prosecutors. And yet we stayed the course and the following year, the state legislature took one day off a sentence to make sure that our misdemeanor laws were, e were even handed. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's an example of where, uh, look at the record, go to my website and see all of the achievements that we have made. Uh, an activist, yes, that's exactly what I have been. And proactive, yes. And you do that sometimes quietly, sometimes you do it, you draw a line in the sand very publicly. I have done both, but only after careful consideration of all the policy implications. All right, thank you very much. Tell us about a professional decision that you have made that you regret or would have done differently in retrospect. And we'll start with Pete Holmes first. That's a tough one. Um, well, I could say, uh, don't bring marijuana to your office if you uh, buy it and you're, you work in a, in a uh, drug-free workplace environment. That is, uh, but sometimes, you know, if you, if you have the courage to go out and demonstrate, as I did back in July of 2014 when our first store opened, I wanted to be one of the first ones in line to buy cannabis through a legal store because I wanted to put my money where my mouth was and demonstrate to the people that this was a, this is legal. This is now legal. The earth has shifted a little bit on the axis. And then in being caught up in a, in a very tight schedule, brought it home, owned it, uh, brought it to the office, uh, owned it and, uh, and, and acknowledged that and am happy to serve as an object lesson because we've got a lot more work to do with our drug-free workplace rules. It's crazy that people can be fired when they're uh, acknowledged uh, medical user, for instance, and they bring that drug to the workplace just in their bloodstream every day. And so, yes, we've got a lot further to go. Um, but if that's the worst one I can think of, uh, then, then I think that that's not such a bad eight years in office. Well, it's gonna be hard to beat that one. <laughs> uh, so, you know, uh, I can't think of a, I can think of a lot of learning moments for me, uh, for my time in City Hall. I can think of a lot of decisions uh, that I made and that subsequently didn't pan out and I changed them. One of them was we were struggling, uh, as we discussed earlier a little bit, with uh, people who were living in RVs, but RVs that weren't safe and weren't functional. And so we actually created RV safe lots and RV safe zones. And, and I spearheaded that project with the Human Services Department. Uh, and I told the mayor, I think we can make this work. And as it turned out, we weren't able to get a lot of people out of their vehicles. It wasn't an exit passage away from homelessness. And the costs uh, actually were quite high. It ended up costing us for the RV safe zones, unfortunately, almost $1,800 per vehicle in order to manage it with all of the sewer requirements, the trash requirements, and other things. And so ultimately, a year later, af after having invested a lot of time and energy into that project to try and make it work, I ended up having to advise the mayor, you know what, mayor, I told you I thought we could make this work. It's not working the way we want it to. It's too expensive. We should devote that money to actually getting people into housing rather than keeping them in their vehicles outside. And we ended up bringing that, uh, bringing that program down. That was a lesson learned, but I think hopefully, uh, you know, that's gonna be my style as city attorney. Innovate, uh, look you. for results, All and right. then correct much. course. Let's move on to the next question here. Um, what is your current involvement with and future expectations for diversion, 
of youth jails, schools to prison, and restorative justice. And we'll begin with Scott Lanzana. Yeah. Well, I really think we need to do a lot more here. So first, on diversion programs. Uh, I was very active with the LEAD program for the last several years. And the LEAD program is Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. I have been the first to say we need to bring that program citywide and we need to expand it to be eligible for several sets of misdemeanor prosecutions. Right now, that program, which was started in 2012, and Mr. Holmes will be quick to say that he was a co-founder of that, we have not brought that program into the misdemeanor realm, even though a lot of folks who are arrested on misdemeanor crimes, like CarProw, are also struggling with the addiction and homelessness that that program should focus on. My big concern here is that we're doing a lot of talk around the city of Seattle about criminal justice reform, but not actually delivering. And that's why I'm very proud to have the support of the head of the Public Defender Association, because we need to actually deliver the results. Last year, the city attorney's office started a program, a $400,000 program to divert people 18 to 24 out of the criminal justice system, $400,000. And that program, as, uh, as of September, had diverted 19. We need to do much better. We need to get real. We need to deliver results. And I don't think it's happening. I think we can do a lot better in criminal justice reform. I absolutely support City Council's uh, zero detention resolution. And my office is working toward that goal every day. Um, I was a co-founder of LEAD. Uh, we remain active participants in it, and we explore how it can be applied across the board. One thing to keep in mind, uh, I already told you that uh, we don't have uh, VUXA jurisdiction, that is drug crime jurisdiction. The other thing that we don't have is juvenile uh, jurisdiction. Our crimes, uh, except in the case of a minor in possession or, or a similar, in some uh, rare DV instances, all of our defendants are age 18 and over, and it's important. It's an arbitrary, frankly, a stupid uh, line of demarcation, but it is the law. Everyone else goes to the county prosecutor uh, as a juvenile. Nonetheless, what we, what we have been doing, in addition to all of those uh, criminal justice reforms that, you, that I've been uh, telling you about, driving while poor, all of these other crimes that we have been totally take, taking a, what are you doing? What are you accomplishing? Get beyond the individual case in front of you. How are you uh, positively impacting our city? And, uh, and instead, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, pre-filing diversion program that Mr. Lindsay refers to, I wish I was getting $400,000, and I wish there were just 19 um, uh, for a, a, a lower amount. But uh, in fact, we are moving the needle forward, a very experimental program to extend uh, from the 13 to 17-year-old to program the county does going from 18 to 24-year-old while the adolescent main, male brain is still developing. All right. We are at the point now where we're going to give each of you an opportunity to make a two-minute closing comment, and we'll start first with Pete Holmes and then to Scott Lindsay. Go ahead, Pete. Thank you, Enrique. Um, thank you all for being here. I want to make it clear to you that uh, you have a unique opportunity. The city attorney in Seattle is the only elected city attorney in the state of Washington. I promised to bring change to the office eight years ago. I did from day one and have never let up. It's important to remember that in addition to being the misdemeanor prosecutor, you are indeed the chief legal counsel for the city, all of its electeds, all of the department heads. I am, in effect, managing the city's law firm, and it takes experience, real legal experience to do that. I've been a lawyer 33 years. I had been a lawyer for 20 years before I even thought about running for office. After six years serving as a chair of the city's very first police oversight board, it has been the hardest legal job of my career and the one that I have loved the most. There's 102 lawyers that uh, are never asked to do anything I haven't done repeatedly. I work with them closely about trial strategies, about legal strategies, and it's amazing. It's a, it's a sight to behold the level that your city attorney's office is now performing on. We're consolidated in one building. We used to be on six floors, three different buildings. We're now in one building where we can coordinate. That's how we can do things like go after the tree cutters in West Seattle. We can leverage our criminal uh, 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 jurisdiction with 
expert civil litigation and make sure that we recover, that we, make, we hold people accountable. We're holding the opioid manufacturers accountable. We're holding uh, Monsanto accountable for the PCB pollution in the Duwamish. Um, and we're holding President Trump accountable. We're going to protect our sanctuary city status and the city attorney is front and center and will continue to do so. This next term is probably more important than ever. I'm already going to be on my fifth mayor before this term ends, and uh, we need stability and progressive values with experience. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Scott Lindsay. Scott Lindsay. Scott Lindsay. No, 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 no. You're, no. you're out of line, sir. This is not your event. You need to sit down or you need to leave. We need, you need to leave. We need to, either you need to sit down or you need to leave. This is not your event. That's all I can tell you. So, you know, Take, either take a walk or just leave. Uh, I'm not going to read your question. We have, we've had the list of questions there, and we're done. So, you know, you, you, if you want to talk to them after we get out, after they're finished, that's fine. Well, I have a lot of questions here. You know, we expect all of you that are here today to, uh, you're here because you want to hear the candidates, and I ask you to be civil and, you, and to be attentive to what's going on here today. So let's, let's try to keep that uh, in line. Thank you very much. All right. Scott Lindsay, let's start with yeah. you. Thank you, Enrique, and thank you all for coming out today. It, it really means a lot that you guys are all so engaged in this important race, and I know you're also looking forward to the council races and the mayoral race. So again, my name is Scott Lindsay. For the last three years, I served as public safety advisor to the mayor of Seattle. Before that, I was an attorney in private practice in both Washington, D.C. and Seattle. And I served as senior counsel to House Oversight Democrats in Washington, D.C., working on some of the big controversies out there. Southwest border trafficking of firearms, uh, corruption in oil contractors in Iraq and Afghanistan. I came into the role of public safety advisor and helped lead some significant initiatives to bring pe people together to take on some of the real tough challenges that we are facing, including the opioid e epidemic, including get a, getting a better handle on our homelessness crisis, addressing some of our real public safety challenges in Chinatown, in Ballard, in Beacon Hill. But here's what I found. Our criminal justice system is not functioning well. In fact, there are very few people who are close observers to that in the courthouse, the public defenders, the prosecutors, the police, who actually believe that it is. The vast majority of folks who are in the criminal justice system as repeat offenders are struggling with addiction and homelessness, and they are not getting, right now, the public health interventions that they need. So this, this race shapes up as an incumbent who's re running on an eight-year record against a challenger with a new vision for how we can do better. So if you think that the status quo is working great, then I think you're gonna go with Mr. Holmes. But if you think that we can actually improve public safety and reform our criminal justice system, bring smart public health interventions into our criminal justice system, actually get people out of the cycle of addiction and homelessness in jail, then I ask you to give me a good shot here. This, I'm proud to have the endorsement of the Seattle Times, the Seattle Firefighters Union, and all five of the current and former members, of the, uh, uh, leaders of the Seattle Community Police Commission. It'd be wonderful to Thank have you. your support. All right, can we give them a round of applause to uh, both candidates? We appreciate it very much. Thank you. I'm Thank short. You. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Take care. Uh, we can well. do a little bit better. How's everyone doing today? <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Okay. That's enough. Um, so I'm Crystal Reed. I'm here as a, thank you, as a community activist. I was part of the Washington Bus previously, and I'm on the board of the Municipal League. And um, I'm here today to give Enrique a little bit of a break. And we thought it would be really, really fun to do a quick vote by applause. Do you think that'll be fun? Okay, do you think that'll be fun? 
Okay, let's do it. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so while we do that, I would love to have the city council position eight folks, uh, candidates come up um, and then we'll do the vote by applause right now. So if you love the answers of the city attorney um, candidate, Pete Holmes, give a round of applause. Are you coming this way? All right. If you love the answers of city attorney candidate Scott Lindsay, give a round of applause. All right. Okay. I think you guys know uh, what just happened, so I'm not going to analyze that. But um, I think we're going to go on to the city council position eight now, and I'll be up next uh, to do vote by applause then. All right. See you then. All right. Here we go, City Council position eight, and we have the two candidates uh, for this position. Uh, we have uh, Teresa Mas Mosqueda, who is here with us, and we also have John Grant. Please welcome them. Appreciate it. Once again, so they know that they will have uh, 90 seconds to respond to the questions, and uh, also at the end, you'll have uh, two minutes to give a closing comment. So uh, here we go. Well, let's start right off the top here. Uh, what specifically sets you apart from your opponent and makes you the best candidate for election to the Seattle City Council and this position of position eight? And we will start alphabetically. We'll start with uh, John Grant, go ahead. All right, the alphabetical advantage. Um, hey everybody, how are you doing? Okay, pretty good, it's nice out. Did you notice? You're here, thank you for being here. Um, I think that there's some pretty big issues at stake in Seattle right now. Um, for the past 10 years, I've been a homelessness and housing activist and have been right here in the community. I actually just live down the street on Rainier. And as the former head of the Tenants Union, we've been trying to tackle um, gentrification and displacement issues from a community standpoint. And I think one of the big decisions that you have to make in this race and one of the big points of contrast between uh, myself and my point, opponent is really around our platforms. Um, we have seen the city put forward a proposal to just require as little as 2% of developments to be affordable to low-income and working-class people. 2% is very close to zero. I've put forward a proposal requiring 25% of all new development to be affordable to working-class people. I have also put forward a proposal calling for a corporate tax on large corporations to build 5,000 units of homeless housing. That would essentially end unsheltered homelessness in our city. Now these are big things that we can do, but I don't think we should stop there. Another big thing that we're seeing time and again is that our police department, uh, you know, it's a very hard job to be a police officer, but we have not seen true reform. And I'd like to see that, our, uh, that we have an independent civilian review board that has the authority to fire the police chief. My opponent does not support these positions. And I think that when we talk about these issues, we have to go for the boldest, strongest platforms to create true systemic reform. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's great to be here. Thank you so much to the large coalition who brought this group together today. I'm incredibly honored to be running for election um, to bring a voice to city council that is from the community. I am a woman. I am a person of color. I am a renter. I am a leader in the labor movement who has fought shoulder to shoulder with working families, with retirees, with our community who is fighting for social and economic justice. I have done this since working at CMAR Community Health Centers, making sure that seniors had access to good quality health care and housing, to making sure that every child in our state had access to health insurance regardless of where they came from, regardless of their citizenship. And at the Washington State Labor Council, I worked for seven years and I still have a day job. I am still working full time and running full time and fighting to make sure that our rights are protected at work, that we have safe work environments, and that we stand up for our lowest wage workers. With your help, we helped to pass minimum wage and sick leave on the ballot last year, an initiative that I helped to draft and that you all passed with about 70% in our county. This is what it looks like to bring people together, 
to make sure that our voices are represented from everything from healthcare as a human right, the coalition that I chair still, to making sure that we create enough housing in our city. I have the endorsement of the Washington Housing Action Alliance, which is the political arm of the um, Low Income Housing Alliance. Folks like Pramila Jayapal and Attorney General Bob Ferguson, who know that I will deliver on affordable housing, create greater economic stability, and make sure that our community voice is heard like I have done every single day at Thank my you. current job. Thank you Thank very you. much. All right, we have a question here uh, from Maya on Capitol Hill. Uh, do you support a right to return policy for residents of buildings that are redeveloped? And do you support requiring 25% of units in new redeveloped buildings to be earmarked for low income housing? Two part question there, but let's begin uh, with Teresa. Go ahead. So, one of the things that I'm calling for is real solutions that will de deliver affordable housing now. If we look at the example of what came out of San Francisco, 25% is what the citizens said that they wanted to see. But what happened after their initiative passed requiring 25% affordable housing was that development stalled. In fact, in a year and a half, only two buildings were created with 25% affordable housing. I would love to see every building have 25%. The reality is we don't have time to go back to the drawing board and renegotiate. What we need to do is push forward to make sure that our community voice is included in every single single up zone discussion, not 2%, but push for the upper limits of 11, recognize that's not enough. That's why I'm calling for us to take every parcel of developable, developable, available land and turn it into affordable housing now. Co-ops, co-housing, create um, affordable units so that families like the one I want to start one day can afford to live in, in Seattle. This is for the missing middle and low income folks. And I'm going to be calling for rent control. It's on my website, has been on there since day one, but I know that rent control is not enough. As a renter right now, if I was locked into my current rent, we still don't have enough housing. So I would like to see us move forward with a multifaceted approach that creates the housing that we need now. The boom is here. We don't have time to wait. And when we come together, we can create things like the Roberto Maestra Plaza, create affordable housing across our community. That also includes uh, senior centers and child care centers and health centers. That's what we can do if we do it right and together. All right. Thank you. John. John Grant. You know, th these forums are really great because you get to hear um, kind of the two directions that the city can take. And you get to hear very elaborate ways that politicians uh, try to say no without saying no. Uh, my opponent doesn't support a 25% affordability mandate, and she references what happened in San Francisco. Well, their affordability mandate started out at 25%, and then the developers pushed back and pushed it to 18%. Okay, the highest it is in Seattle right now is around a, like 10, like no, 9%. So that's twice, they got twice what we got. So I have to say, does that sound like we got the better end of that bargain? I would argue no. And that means that we need to push hard against the Chamber of Commerce and developers' interests. I'm the only, only candidate in this race who has kept a pledge not to accept donations from downtown developers. And that's a signal to you about who you're gonna be answerable to. If we can push hard, we can actually get far more affordable housing from the private sector and not just rely on the public to foot the bill. The second part of that question was, do you support a right of return? for tenants who are displaced. That is a right that I fought for as the head of the Tenants Union time and again. And we were successfully able to get that included in the redevelopment of Yesler Terrace when tenants were getting pushed out and they would have had no right to return. We need to have that in the private sector too, so that if you're getting displaced, you have a right to return to your home. But not only that, people should be, not be displaced in the first place. And I want to give tenants the right of first refusal. That's a right that enables you, the tenant, to collectively work together and buy the building with the help from the city to get it off the private market in the first place. We need to start pushing hard so that tenants can have ownership over thank, their own land. Thank you, John. All right. Do you, and John, I'm going to start with you first on this one. Cool. Uh, do you support a city income tax? I absolutely support the municipal income tax, but here's the deal. Um, we've been trying to get this at the state level for the, well, gosh, for decades, and we have seen it just stall time and again. It was thanks to the grassroots organizers uh, at the Transit Riders Union and many other grassroots groups which, uh, who have endorsed me in this race because they know that we need an organizing voice at the city council. That, we got that win at the city hall because we came together as a community and organized at the grassroots level and pushed for that change. But that is gonna get stalled in the courts. So that means that we need to be looking for other revenue sources too. That means that we need to have impact fees on new developments. 
Uh, this is a, uh, a law that is on the books in every other city in the county except here in Seattle because developers don't want to have to pay for their impacts on our infrastructure, housing, and schools. So we need to pass impact fees because we have left hundreds of millions of dollars on the table. And do you all remember that $930 million move Seattle levy that got passed a couple years ago? Nine, it was almost a billion dollars that you all paid for. You all had to pay for a billion dollar levy because we haven't had impact fees that could have helped reduce the cost of that. That means the private sector is forcing the public to pay for its growth, where I, think the, where I believe that growth should pay for growth. So let's bring in new progressive revenue sources, pass impact fees, uh, push for the municipal income tax, and also let's raise taxes on corporations. We haven't raised the corporate tax rate in 20 years. That's, that's wild. How many levies have we passed on low-income homeowners? We need to make sure that the private sector is paying its fair share. Thank you, John. So not only do I support the ability for us to tax high-income earners, I have worked on this issue both at City Hall and in the halls of Olympia. As an advocate, as a lobbyist with the Children's Alliance, we are crippling ourselves in this state and in this city by not having the ability to go after true, true progressive revenue. We have a regressive system and the most regressive tax system in the entire country because, unfortunately, Tim Iman's legacy, boo, Tim Iman, uh, he continues to live on here. And so we look at things like levies. We look at things like additional taxes on sales tax. This is not a way to create enough revenue that we need. So absolutely, I am 100% supportive of the city's effort to try to challenge our inability to tax wealth. The other thing that I will do, though, as that works its way through court, is be an advocate like I have done every single year in the halls of Olympia to say we need more tools. We need tools right now to tax capital gains. People are making lots of money by pushing a button on their computer, and they are trading stocks and bonds. There's a lot of those folks who just live on the other side of the lake here. So I would like to see us have a local, a regional capital gains tax. I will continue to call for more progressive revenue in the halls of Olympia as well. And in the meantime, I'm going to be seeing what we can do to get dollars in the door right now that are not regressive. Uh, uh, for example, bonding against existing MHA dollars, the dollars that will be coming, bonding against existing housing levy dollars. Yes, it's a loan, but get those dollars in now so we can build the housing that we need now. All right. Is police brutality and excessive force still an issue in Seattle? Do you believe people of color and minority groups are targeted more by police? Why or why not? And if it is, what are your plans to address it? And let's start with Teresa. Um, yes, it is still an unfortunate issue where police um, abuse, where um, excessive force is still used, especially in our communities of color. In lower income communities and in communities of color, we have seen reports as of this month, as of last month, that continue to say that while on a whole our state is doing better, communities of color still experience higher rates of excessive force, which is unacceptable. We have taken some steps in the city of Seattle, and I am proud of our city council for passing the um, police commission reforms, but we have to do more. I'm calling for an independent oversight committee that has community members, not just citizens, but community members. I want us to do more in terms of creating a mental health team that works with our police force, because the folks who showed up at Charlena Lyle's home should have had a mental health provider there or a case manager there, knowing her history instead of showing up with force and showing up with a gun on. We should also be thinking about ways that we get more of our com uh, community police um, brigades out there working within our own community from communities that we represent and not folks who have guns but more folks who have mental health training. The other thing is what I hear from the community police commission folks who are supporting me is they are tired of politicians who go in and just point fingers and say that there is a blame um, to be had. What we need to do is take responsibility. As your city out, Seattle City Council person, I will be transparent with you from what we're asking for and be transparent with what was received. But we need to get a contract now. And what John calls for will not get us a contract. All right, John Grant. So this is a really important issue. And I think that police reform is one of the biggest divides in this race. And I just think that you know, for all of you to know, uh, her name is actually pronounced Charlena Lyles. She's named after her father. And the reason I know that is that I went to the hearing where city council members, I'm sorry? Keep going. No, someone else. Oh, uh, city council members uh, were being held accountable by the community for their weak actions on police reform. My opponent talks about having a community advocate being a part of the negotiation pro process with the contracts, but just think about that for a minute. The city council, the nine members, represent you, the public, in those negotiations with the union. 
That means that they're the ones that are ultimately accountable. What is this one community representative going to do that the city council shouldn't already be doing? That's why in matters of discipline, I am calling for transparency in the police contract so that you, the public, can know what kind of deal that you're getting because it's your civil liberties that are on the table and ultimately, disproportionately, the lives of people of color like Charlena that we saw lose her life because the police couldn't follow their own policies by having a non-lethal option when they were responding to a woman who, had, who was flagged with a mental health issue. We know that we can do better than that. My opponent has been endorsed by the King County Labor Council. I went into that same interview and they asked me, do you support having transparency in negotiations? I looked in the SPOG representative's eyes and I said yes, knowing that it would lose me the endorsement. That means that we have an opportunity right now in this election to do something bold about police reform right, and Joe. actually hold Thank officers you, accountable for All this right. behavior. Thank you very much. All right, move, next question. Seattle's economic boom with major companies such as Amazon housing their headquarters in the heart of the city have split many residents. Some feel tech wages have priced them out of the city. Others feel like our low unemployment and thriving local economy are directly due to the major multinational companies with headquarters or offices here. So what's the balance for Seattle residents and Seattle's tech dynasty? How do we find a balance in all of this? John. Oh gosh, balance with all the tech folks that are coming in. Um, you know, I think that we want to be welcoming to new people in the city no matter what. But we also have to recognize that a lot of these folks are higher income people and that has impacts on our communities, right? Uh, that means that the existing housing stock tends to get rented out to higher income people and that rises rents. Uh, I, I think that when we have this economic engine in the city, I don't think we turn away from it. I don't think we say uh, no to it, but I think that gives us leverage as a city with the private sector to say, What's the best deal that we can get? If Amazon is gonna grow here and continue to grow here, which they are regardless of what they do with their, headquarter, their second headquarters, that means that we can put a tremendous, um, uh, you know, we can address the in inequities in our city by doing what the city council is doing right now by passing an employee hours tax. I don't know if you heard about this, it's kind of wonky, but basically it's a tax on corporations that they're negotiating right now in the city budget. I have not heard where my opponent stands on this, this corporate tax. I fully support it and I have called for a tax on corporations to build affordable housing. We can also make sure that all the development that's happening from this, from this economic growth from uh, the tech industry is redirected towards community benefits. That's why we need impact fees to improve our schools, to improve our sidewalks, to, to actually address uh, the stresses on our, on our infrastructure. But we have to have the political will, right, to hold those companies accountable and get the best deal for our community and for our city. Otherwise, we are going to see this economic engine drive people out, and we cannot lose generations of Seattleites right. to that growth. Thank you. Tennis. Okay, well, I just want to be really clear. I think some of the things that John likes to say make it sound like I'm supported by Amazon, which I am not. I have made a pledge to not accept any corporate donations, which I have kept. In fact, the folks that um, were supporting the Chamber of Commerce candidate uh, didn't win this last election. That's why we're both here. I have the endorsement of every union, Pramila Jayaval, Attorney General Bob Ferguson, environmental groups, women's health advocates, folks who want this city to be thriving and for us to figure out how we can all live and work together in the city that we call home. So the folks who are coming here from Amazon, let's recognize many of them are also immigrant, immigrant workers who are coming here. Many of them want to stay here in Seattle and have a family and start a home here. We want to be welcoming. We say we're a welcoming city. Let's figure out now how we create enough housing for our entire city by doing things like creating not just apartments where many of these folks are currently living and working, but creating thriving living communities. One, two, and three bedrooms. That's what I hear from the folks from Seattle Tech for Housing. Workers in the tech industry who came to me and said, we recognize that the tech industry is part of the problem that is causing gentrification. We want to be part of the solution with the community. I think if we work together, we can create one and two bedrooms throughout our community. We can create more opportunities for folks to live in duplexes and in triplexes across our community. The, the ability to create density done right and to have good living wage jobs like what we see in the tech industry, but hold those corporations accountable because it is not just the folks who write code who need a good living wage. It is the people in the distribution centers, as well as the janitors, as well as the security workers. We can create good living jobs in that industry in Seattle. Okay, what city programs would you like to evaluate for effectiveness to see if they're doing what, you, what we think they are or should be doing? We'll start with you, Tedesco. Okay, I got, I got two, two things that I want us to evaluate right away. 
Um, number one is we don't need to evaluate sweeps. They have already proven that they're not working. They're moving folks from one corner to another and they're actually causing deficiencies in the system. When our community partners want to go and help somebody get the health services they need, tell them they finally have housing, they can't find the folks anymore. That's what I heard directly from youth care who works with youth who are homeless. So we know that sweeps are not working. We have to stop that immediately. Instead, we should be reevaluating how we get folks into housing now, low barrier facilities, more permanent supportive housing, more shelters. What I don't think is working is rapid rehousing, where we take the public dollar and pay for folks' rent at full market cost. That is not working for the majority of the population. I'd like to see who it's working for, because there's probably that mom out there that has a job starting next month, and if she doesn't pay her month this rent, or the month her rent this month, she might get kicked out. For those folks, maybe it's working, but I'd like to see an analysis, because this is not the market that they have in Salt Lake City. This is a white heart market, and we shouldn't be using those public dollars to, to supplant um, uh, uh, landlords' um, paychecks. Number two, um, Nick Licata just put out a really good piece this morning saying that we should do an analysis of the streetcars um, to actually figure out if it's helping to move people to and from work and to and from childcare and school, not just those who are wanting to stop and go shopping. Yes, we want folks to tour around our city, but that is not what the public dollars should be used for. All right. John? I think that we need to absolutely block the new youth jail. When we talk about these public investments in our criminal justice system, we really have to ask ourselves, is this the best deal that we could be getting for our community? Is this what's right? Uh, this is a, a institution that would cost $210 million. When there's been a study that shows for a few million dollars the existing facility could be renovated. Think of what we could have been using that money for. Think of all the diversions programs that we could have been investing in. Think of all the uh, you know, restorative justice programs that we know are key to closing the school to prison pipeline, right? These are programs that we have seen have success. Look at the, the law enforcement assisted diversions program. This is a program that's mostly in downtown Seattle. It's not citywide. It's had a 65% success rate, success rate of diverting uh, folks who have committed crimes from a, you know, a lifetime in jail to social services, mental health counseling, and drug, drug, uh, drug counseling. And it's reduced recidivism by 65%. We can actually reduce crime if we make the investments to actually make sure we rehabilitate people and start using our criminal justice system to flood our jails with people who, who have you know, very few other options. We, this is, you know, per capita, the United States is the most incarcerated in the world, right? We don't have to be that way. We can actually create a world that we want to live in, but it starts by making those investments, Thank and you. the youth jail is not one we should right. be making. All right, John, this goes to you. We start with uh, safe injection sites. Where do you stand? So I think it's good to call out, um, you know, Seattle for leadership on this issue. And I think that we should actually be calling for safe consumption sites. So it's not just uh, focused on injections. What we know about safe consumption sites from other cities like in, in, uh, in Vancouver and in BC, what, what we see is that these programs save lives. If somebody is um, addicted to drugs, this is not a criminal justice problem. This is a public health problem. And if somebody dies, if it's your daughter, if it's your sister, if it's your cousin, it's whoever it is in your family, they don't have an opportunity to recover later. And safe consumption sites save hundreds of lives uh, every year. I think that Seattle should absolutely be taking the leadership on this program and that we should be targeting uh, it in areas where we know that we have huge problems with addiction. Uh, there is so much that the city can be doing, but we can't keep criminalizing uh, what is essentially a disease and actually start treating it like the public health issue that we know that it is. I'm glad to hear you use some of my public health terminology. Yay. Um, I am a public health activist. I'm a public health um, expert by background. I've worked at CMAR Community Health Centers, the Department of Health, Children's Alliance, Fighting for Health Care for All Kiddos, Community Health Network. This is a public health issue. And I've been talking about this since day one as being a true public health crisis. 
a public health response leads with compassion. It leads with looking at the human. It leads with looking at the humane response instead of a criminal response first. And so I have, from day one, been supportive of safe consumption sites as a way for us to make sure that we are removing from the streets folks who are using right now. They are using in our parks. They're using in our streets. And these are our friends. These are our neighbors. These could be our kiddos one day. We know the consequence of the opioid um, crisis, and I am applauding Attorney General Bob Ferguson in our own county for going after the opioid manufacturers for having a role in this. That is the right thing to do. It is also the right thing to do by, to lead by example here in Seattle. While the rest of the county may have some concerns, and rightly so, I think people have a lot of questions, I think we can show that it works by having a conversation with folks, talking to them about what the impact would be in their community, answering questions that they might have. We can play these sites throughout Seattle. I'm thinking of at least two, and the two areas that I've seen where we have the highest number of uh, overdoses and deaths are in Pioneer Square and in the U District. If these are the areas where we know people are dying, let's solve that now and remember that we have to continue to do All outreach right. and you. education. Okay, we've reached the point now where each of you have an opportunity to make a closing statement. You each get two minutes, and we start with you, Teresa. Okay, um, so I just first wanna thank all of the sponsors once again. This is an incredible opportunity to I hope hear more from you and I'd love to see the rest of the questions. I am not a politician. I haven't run before. I have a day job that has basically allowed me to be able to think about running for office with the help of the democracy vouchers. I can now see myself running for office. And here we are just three weeks away from the election. I would love to work with you because many of the issues that I see coming out of the community are issues I've worked on. From food um, insecurity issues, from food deserts, I wanna be there with you to fight for a food innovation district right here in our community. From making sure that everyone has access to sick leave and an increase in the minimum wage and safe job places, I want to be there with you making sure that we have good economic opportunities for everyone in our community. And especially as I look at our black and our brown youth and our numbers, a high numbers of unemployment, I want to be there with you to make sure that we create career pipelines into good living wage jobs through apprenticeship programs, pre-apprenticeship programs in school, and free college tuition is what I'm calling for here in the city of Seattle. San Francisco is doing it. New York State is doing it. We can do it here. The other thing is I have been there fighting with you shoulder to shoulder, and while I might not have been able to be there in some communities getting arrested, I have from the time I can remember been on the streets fighting with our community from everything from fighting against the Gulf War when I was in high school to fighting against the WTO when I was at UW. I have been there fighting on the strike lines down here in the South End with our drayage truck drivers and standing in solidarity at City Hall calling for those who are Uber and Lyft drivers to be able to have the right to collectively bargain. These are issues that I have fought for every single day. And I know the smell and the taste of tear gas. I have seen my own dad get tear gas just six inches from his face. And I will be there making sure that we hold our police accountable because this is what it looks like to raise your voice, get elected, and represent community. I hope to do that for you on Seattle City Council. All right, thank you, John. John Grant. John, John Grant. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is a hard race. You know, I think that we have some big decisions to make as a city. And you know, I just know from my time as a community organizer, you know, I've been where you are, sitting in the audience watching, you know, folks that we hope to be city council members, giving us platitudes and giving us promises. And I've been so frustrated as, as a person in, who's been in the community, as our homelessness situation has gotten worse, as rents have been going through the roof. I mean, I think that we can actually do something about this. Um, I put forward a platform to actually address the kind of systemic inequalities that we're talking about. I've talked about raising taxes on large corporations to build 5,000 units of housing for the homeless. My opponent doesn't support that. I think we can do it. I've talked about giving tenants the right to collectively bargain so that they can actually have the political power to lower their rents. This is something that we've been trying to fight for for years at the Tenants Union. You know, I, I don't have a long list of endorsements necessarily like my opponent does, but I have been endorsed by one person that I really care about, and his name's Revy Washington. He's a homeless resident uh, who was in Soto, who was swept by our city. And I was down there working with Revy, trying to improve the conditions at the encampment that the city created. And that endorsement means the world to me. 
because this campaign is about putting those voices first. It's about putting the folks who have been the target of the city, whether it's a homeless person or, or our neighborhoods or you know, someone's been abused by the police. It means putting those voices first. And we have been going to those communities to build out our platform. Our platform is built on and around the community, right? This is coming from the community. And that means we can have that voice on the city council to hold developers accountable, to hold police accountable. And I think that's what we can do. We can do that as a city. We can accomplish this together. Um, but it means that we have to have the courage to say, we're going to stand up. We're going to stand up to those powerful interests and hold them accountable. All right. I ask for your Thank support you. and your vote. Thank you. Thank you. A round of applause for both candidates. Thank you very much. I'm back. Wow, the back filled in quite a bit. It's a great turnout. Um, as folks are leaving, uh, you know what I'm up here for. Do you know what I'm up here for? You know what I'm up here for. Yeah, thank you, one person. I'm so popular. All right, uh, <laughs> thanks. Um, all right, so we're gonna do a vote by applause as we did previously. If you wanna give it up for a city council position eight candidate, John Grant. Give a round of applause. All right, that's pretty good, that's pretty good. Uh, give a round of applause if you love the answers of City Council position eight. Candidate Teresa Mosqueda. Interesting. I love doing these. These are really fun. I wish I could like move around more so I can hype you guys up more. But um, all right, so next we're gonna have city council position nine. If the candidates can come on stage, that would be great. And we'll get started. Thank you. Happy Sunday. All right. I need my timer to get time ready. Here we go, folks. We got 25 minutes, and uh, each of you will have uh, 90 seconds to respond to, to each question. You'll get two minutes at the uh, end to make a uh, closing comment. So uh, here we go. Let's start with this. Um, how do you go about? preserving and protecting the ethnic composition of our neighborhoods. Capitol Hill and the Central District are changing in a way that pushes out seniors and ethnic populations. What can you do to make a change, to make a difference? And let's uh, begin with you, incumbent uh, Lorna Gonzalez. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Happy Sunday. I'm Lorena Gonzalez, uh, running for re-election to Seattle City Council position nine. Um, as it relates to making sure that we continue to be an inclusive city, it's part of the work that I've been doing on city council over the last two years and before that um, when I was a civil rights lawyer and leader and activist within the community for um, well over 10 years. And so I think that when we're talking about making sure that we continue to be an inclusive city, um, we have to make sure that our policies, every single one of them from transit investments to um, infrastructure, to, uh, to how we fund uh, various programs throughout the city are really rooted in that uh, race and social justice equity lens that we're required to use at the city to make sure that those who need the services the most are the ones who are receiving those services. Some work that I've done specifically within the immigrant and refugee community includes funding, uh, creating a legal defense fund to develop a $1 million legal defense fund to help undocumented immigrants uh, and refugees uh, get a fighting chance in deportation proceedings. Uh, I have also passed several resolutions to set the city on a path forward to bring community stakeholders and city agencies together to develop policies on how we're gonna continue to make sure that our uh, immigrant communities, our LGBTQ community, and other communities continue to be resilient and successful within our community. All right, Pat, Mayor Kami. Well, if the race and social justice lens distorts the reality, we need to get rid of the lens. We need to just talk directly to communities. When we do global upzones of our neighborhoods of color, 
then we're driving them out. We're doing our own economic eviction of property owners. We have a very diverse base of, of uh, property owners south of Madison, all races. Come doorbelling with me if you don't believe me because the narrative has been that homes are only owned by wealthy white people and nothing could be further from the truth. So I want us to rezone back to current usage so that people can afford to live in their homes that have been owned sometimes for multiple generations. I also want c communities to determine their own future rather than de outside developers dictating what development happens, such as the Promenade 23 that is now going away, is probably gonna drive up property values and costs uh, around that immediate area. The people that live in the Central District should have de determined what should be done in their own community, and their voice was not heard. They're getting rid of the Red Apple and an outside store that nobody wants that doesn't have union labor is going to come in. This has to change. Neighborhoods should be able to determine where their density goes within their own neighborhoods. All right. Thank you. How do we keep uh, our streets safe while maintaining compassion for our growing homeless population? We begin with Pat. Well, I, I believe we really need to get people into shelter. It's really disrespectful to have people living in tents and RVs. And as someone who camps and has an RV, it's not a, a fun place to live on a long-term basis. It's great for a weekend, but not in the rain. So I want to create campuses in a dormitory style and, uh, and, and have surrounding services there. That means mental health, job counseling, um, and uh, drug rehab. There would be laundry, la uh, showers, a kitchen facility. This is a, an intermediary step to getting people the, the help that they need and into permanent housing. And uh, I've been contacted by a community member. There's even a cruise ship that's available for sale we could dock it out at the waterfront and it would be immediate housing with running water and electricity. And the, the sheds that the city refers to as tiny houses don't have those amenities. That, those are the basic requirements, I think, for something to be called or referred to as a house. So we can do so much more with the money that we've spent and I think too much of our city tax dollars have been wasted and we're not seeing results where we're truly helping our homeless population. Lorena. Thank you. So um, obviously we continue to be as a city in a state of emergency as it relates to our unhoused population. Um, it is unfortunate that we are still in a state of emergency and the reality is, is that as a city we're having a hard time keeping up with the number of people who are um, entering into, into homelessness. And it's important for us to recognize that these folks, uh, even though they don't have the luxury and the privilege of, like many of us, living in a space that is heated with four walls and a roof over their head, that they still have rights on the street. And in fact, there was a, a case that just came out of uh, the Court of Appeals in Division Two that reaffirmed that that talked about how important it is to recognize that unsheltered people still have constitutional rights to due process and to public safety and to having their basic needs met by cities, including law enforcement. That's why I will continue to oppose any effort to criminalize our unsheltered and homeless population. And we must instead continue to double down on figuring out how to, how to deliver basic services to these folks who are trying their best to survive every day and who need the city to help them create a bridge into services that they so desperately need, whether it's mental health or housing or, or, or addiction services. It's in, incredibly important for us to double down on those efforts to make sure that we continue to build that trust, to welcome folks into available uh, housing options for them. All right. Do you support a city income tax? We'll start with Lorena. So I voted yes on it, so I think the answer to that is yes. Um, I, I did uh, vote in favor of the high earners income tax. Um, I think it was an Im Im important step for the city to take forward. Uh, we worked closely as a council with folks within uh, the community who were advocating for this approach to um, happen. Uh, we also worked very closely with our city attorney's office and with outside legal counsel to make sure that we were putting the city 
on a path forward where we could have the best case possible uh, once we got sued. And sure enough, uh, we got sued. I think it was about five times over. Uh, so we are going to continue to defend our action on the city council, and we're going to continue to try to push back on uh, the laws that, that really do limit our ability as a city to be able to find progressive revenue streams rather than constantly going to the property tax, to the sales tax, to the B&O tax well, uh, to be able to really fund the growing needs of the city around infrastructure, services for homeless, um, enhanced services in our public health system, including sending nurses to uh, to pregnant moms' homes uh, to, who are low income, who really are unable to afford their own health care. These are the things that we need to continue to be able to fund, and we need to be able to challenge the systems in place that have prohibited us from being able to really pursue progressive options. Pat. Well, I have no problem taxing uh, people fairly, and, and the wealthy should pay their fair share. But I am not going to support half-baked legislation that's already had lawsuits. It's going to go down in flames in the, uh, with, with regard to the state constitution anyway. There have been numerous attempts since the 1930s to enact a, an income tax, and they failed. So even with the tax on the wealthy, the wealthy are paying maybe this much in tax now. They'll pay this much. But the low income are still paying this. It's not addressing this problem. We are driving people out of the city because we're taxing our low income families way too much. So from day one, I pledge to work with other municipalities across this state to together go and lobby the state legislature and have them change the state constitution where we can have a graduated income tax across the entire state, not in a bubble of Seattle, that does not tax low-income families at all for income tax and gradually more depending on your income. But that is in combination with greatly lowering our sales tax and greatly lo lowering our property tax. That's what's going to solve our regressive tax system. This Partial tax on the wealthy can be dodged and does not address regressiveness, and that's what we need to be doing. What are your real concrete plans for our city's transportation issues? Is your priority more cars and parking lots or pushing for al alternative modes of transportation such as rail and bike? We begin with Pat. Well, we need to get people out of their cars. It's, if we've got too many people, not enough parking, but we, in order to get people out of their cars, we have to have alternatives. There are people in East Lake waiting three and four buses to get on to go home after work because we've had so many people enter our city, um, especially working for Amazon. So we need some fast, effective solutions. That means increasing bus lines. And I want to have us install a gondola system. It costs about 20% of fixed rail. We have the geography for it here in Seattle. We have a lot of hills. And we can put stops on existing buildings. We don't need to build stations. We could rent space. We could move people quickly and connect to our fixed rail lines that we do have in existence. So. Uh, also, that has a much smaller footprint than fixed rail does for us. So we need to think outside the box and find creative solutions, look at other municipalities around the world, find out what they're doing that's effective, and start implementing them now because we take way too long in the planning process. So I, um, I primarily use public transit to get around the city, um, and that's a, a, a choice I made um, about a year ago is to just get myself out of my own car, because if I was asking folks as an elected official to consider doing the same, I thought it was important for me to try it out myself. And I have to tell you that I, I'm really glad that I made that choice, not just because I think that getting out of our, our, our cars really helps to benefit our climate and uh, in the era of the number of uh, natural disasters that we are experiencing, I feel more committed than ever to try to really, um, really get at our transit issues here in this city. I think uh, I've already been working on these issues. I advocated for the passage of the Move Seattle levy to provide us uh, more uh, money, and thanks to the voters, they approved this so that we can deal with infrastructure uh, issues that'll help us get around the city more easily. Um, 
the, the other thing that I think is really important is that we need to continue to invest in making sure that we protect the bus service that we currently have and build additional bus service. And that needs to be coupled with, uh, with dedicated bus lanes so that we are moving a large volume of people throughout the city much, much quicker, and we're making it an easier choice for people to want to get on the bus uh, to, to move faster through our city. I know what it feels like to be passed up by a bus. I know what it feels like to just be standing in room uh, all the time. So we need to make sure that we continue to uh, have those investments and, of course, continue to invest in light rail. Where do you stand on safe injection sites, Lorraine? Um, so I, am, I, as a city council member, have the opportunity to sit uh, as a representative for the city of Seattle on the Seattle King County uh, Board of Public Health. That has been a wonderful experience for me, and, and it really um, uh, has shown me and taught me that when we are talking about issues related to addiction, that it's incredibly important for us to approach those issues through a public health lens. You heard some of the candidates speak about this um, just before we came up here. I am supportive of safe consumption sites. I think it's incredibly important for us to um, uh, deploy that strategy that was recommended by a task force that worked on these issues for over a year and released their recommendations in May. It, that task force included uh, physicians, public health experts, addiction experts, uh, and folks who have themselves experienced addiction. And so I think it's important for us at this juncture in our city where we are experiencing an incredible amount of deaths, preventable deaths as a result of uh, heroin overdoses and other opioid addictions, that we take those recommendations seriously and that we begin the process of implementing them. And the process of beginning to implement those recommendations around a safe consumption of site include, first and foremost, working with community to identify uh, a common sense location of where we can begin to site um, a safe consumption site that includes wraparound services so that folks can uh, begin the process of recovery. Thank you. Pat. Well, um, I would challenge all of you to look at the BC Coroner's Report and coastal Vancouver where they have not one but two safe injection sites has a higher death rate uh, by illicit drugs than any other part, of, that's per 100,000, by the way, than any other part of Vancouver. So it's clearly not working. I personally, uh, in my bag in the back, I carry a naloxone kit. I'm prepared to save lives. That's what we need to do. If we, th this should be about saving lives. We should all carry them. I think we could use fire and police stations as a place for people to go in the interim. But what we really need to do is spend our money on a solution, not on enabling people to kill themselves a little more slowly, because heroin is toxic. I support having sub free 24-7 access to Suboxone, Methadone. There are other drugs that help people get off of heroin. We have to help people turn their lives around. And I personally took the time to go up to Vancouver, BC, and it is not a pretty sight. Directly across the street from Insight, someone was overdosing. Two people were being arrested. And they have a rehab center or a detox center up above Insight. As soon as they walk out the door and onto the street, the dealers are in their face. They're doomed to fail. And we can't have that here. I encourage you to Google downtown Vancouver East Side and ask yourself where in Seattle we're going to place that kind of a facility. All right. Is police brutality and excessive force uh, uh, still an issue here as far as you're concerned? And do you believe people of color, minority groups, are targeted more by police? And uh, if so, then what are your plans to really deal with this? And let's begin with Pat. Yes, I absolutely do believe it's still a problem. I'm president of the South Seattle Crime Prevention Council. That's an all-volunteer organization. And in that capacity, I worked like a pit dog, pit bull, to get rid of a racist captain and a racist sergeant. I was getting nothing but complaints about people that were being stopped for driving while black. That's not acceptable. The problem is our police department does not reflect the faces of our community. We need a more diverse police force, and we need to aggressively recruit from outside municipalities, uh, recruiting people that will go through the academy here in this state. We need to make a concerted effort to do that. Secondly, uh, we need to encourage our young people to become officers and I think that the uh, Explorer program that's going on is great because every Explorer that I've met 
reflect the faces of our community here in Southeast, and I think that in the future is going to change the police department. But in the interim, I think that we can devise a way to test our existing officers. If they have a bias against people of color, it's gonna hurt, but we need to find other officers. They need to be retired. Um, there, we cannot have what's going on here now where people of color are being singled out. Mm -hmm. All right. Go ahead. Um, so you heard me say um, when we first started that I um, was a civil rights attorney for 10 years before coming to city council. Um, part of my bread and butter practice was suing police across the state, not just the Seattle Police Department, but across the state for excessive force and bias policing. It's an area that I have spent a lot of time uh, working on, um, both as a lawyer and as a community activist. Since I've been on the city council, I've passed two different measures on these issues. One was working closely with our community police commission to get uh, the most sweeping version of police uh, reform across the finish line that was unanimously supported by the city council that passed in May of 2017. And we're beginning the process of implementing many of the reforms that are included in there that address specifically the issues um, related to use of force and what happens if you do engage in use of force or bias policing. I also worked with council member, uh, excuse me, council president Bruce Harrell uh, to work on crafting an ordinance related to bias-free policing. The city does have bias-free uh, policing policies, anti-bias policies, and, and we thought it was important to memorialize those policies in law, which is what we, what we have done. Lastly, I'll mention that um, uh, we are currently working on uh, community service officers and bringing those community service officers back. I think that's how we make sure that we have uh, 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 additional law enforcement who can look and right. understand community needs. Thank you. Based on a recent report produced by the city for all jobs in the city, including those classified as green jobs, People of color are concentrated in the lower ranks and the entry level positions. What will you do to remove structural barriers so that more people of color move into the living wage leadership roles in city government, especially in green jobs? Let's start with you. Well, we've, we did some funding around this particular um, issue last year during our city council budget process. So there's, I think, a, a lot more opportunity there to continue to change those numbers around. So we worked with, um, uh, with Got Green to take a look at precisely the issue that you highlighted and found um, some opportunities to be able to um, make it, for example, easier to apply for uh, for green jobs within the city to make it more well known that we have these opportunities available and to create some internship opportunities to be able to create an on um, on ramp to being able to enter into some of the higher level positions. Really ultimately the city has to continue to be committed to making sure that we are investing in our own workforce by and through professional development programs. Uh, that's something that I've been working on in the city, um, not just in the green, green job um, uh, context, but it, uh, as, a, as a whole as it relates to all of the city. So I'll give you another example. We're doing an, inequi an, an equity analysis as it relates to who we hire within the fire department and within the police department. And part of our analysis is, is identifying these structural barriers, like where are we losing people in the process? Do, and, and in large part, it is around testing. We require people to take three or four tests uh, oftentimes, and we end up seeing an attrition of a lot of people of color in those testing systems. We need to make sure that we are doing that, that thoughtful analysis in the context of all of our hiring systems. Okay. Pat? Uh, well, I'd first like to say we need to acknowledge and thank the uh, uh, Community Police Commission that wrote the police reform legislation that was enacted by the City Council. Uh, with regard to jobs, uh, I'd like to see uh, intern more internships for our youth so that they're prepared when they graduate from high school to get good living wage jobs, and the city can provide those. The city should also provide paid internships for people of color. But one of the things that we can do is we can, outside the city uh, is, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot one thing. One of our problems is three quarters of our city employees don't live in Seattle. So we need to have a priority for people that live in Seattle if we're gonna raise the economic status of, of our own community. I think that's really critical. 
but we can encourage other employers to do more for our citizens. Amazon, for example, could be training people that live here that are un or underemployed so that the wealth is here for us so that we're raising, we have people getting six-figure salaries instead of recruiting people from outside. It would also take the pressure off of our need for new housing stock. So there are things that the city could do to encourage that among many of our big employers. And we can also encourage more remote access working from home because then you don't have to get on transit or drive your car to get to your job. And it's an, an extremely effective way of working. All right. We've reached that point where uh, both of you have the opportunity to make a closing comment. Uh, you have two minutes each. Pat, we'll start with you. Well, thank you so much for having us. I enjoyed being here. I love Southeast Seattle. I've lived here for over 27 years. Um, I believe I will be the best candidate for this job. Uh, the incumbent has a bird's eye view of the city. I have an on the sidewalk, ground level view of neighborhoods across the city. I was on the city neighborhood council. I was vice president of that before the, the, our mayor got rid of our district councils and, and stifled the voice of neighborhoods. I have been a member of the federation of community councils. I have clients across the city. I have lived across the city. So I know this city from the inside, not from the top down. And I promise to continue the decades long volunteer work I've done trying to make our city a better place, standing up for neighborhoods, standing up for those that are underrepresented, not listened to. I promise to be working for all of you, not the big developers, because our city council does a marvelous job of protecting their interests. They need to develop what we need, what works for us. We should not be serving their needs of, of excessive profitability. So I would love to be your voice for small businesses, for neighborhoods, and I vow to continue that work. I'm ready to do it. All right, Lorena. Thank you. Lorena. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if I'm, you can. Okay. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Lorena Gonzalez. Um, again, it would be my pleasure to continue serving the people of the city of Seattle in this citywide um, role. I am tremendously proud of the work that I have been able to accomplish uh, on behalf of and with community over the last two years. And uh, that work includes, as you heard me mention, working with the Community Police Commission to pass comprehensive police reform. Uh, this is something that has not been done in years um, and that we desperately need as a community. I was proud to be able to work with them to be able to get that over the finish line. And there is a lot more work to be done as it relates to getting out of underneath that consent decree. I'm the only person currently on city council who has the depth of experience necessary to make sure that, that the legislative branch understands how we're going to comply with the Department of Justice's consent decree and move us forward. I fought alongside a statewide coalition to advocate and make the case for Seattle working families around a paid family and medical leave insurance program. I worked on that issue for a year and a half, dug in, rolled up my sleeves, talked to over 100 small business owners to un identify what their concerns are. And I'm proud to say that Governor Inslee in May of 2017 signed that bill into law and beginning in 2019, uh, all workers in, across the state, including here in the city of Seattle, will have access to a minimum of 12 weeks paid leave based on a progressive benefit, meaning that if you, if you earn less, you get more in terms of wage replacement. Lastly, I'm incredibly proud of the fact that I have been able to be a dogged advocate and champion for immigrant and refugee communities because I come from an immigrant family. My parents came to this country from Mexico originally as undocumented immigrants before adjusting their status. I understand what it means to be left out by the system and I understand what is at stake for our city right now. We are changing, that is true, and we need to make sure that we continue to protect the most vulnerable and that we continue to create space where people can continue to feel that they are part of this city, and that is what I'd like to do for the next four years. Thank you very much. Let's uh, give it up for both candidates, Lorena Gonzalez and Pat Murakami. All right, I got up here a little bit later. 
Um, all right, so we're about to go into the debate you all have been waiting for, but before we do that, we're going to vote by applause once again. Um, so give it, if you, you know how to do this by now. If you're in favor of city council position nine, um, candidate Lorena Gonzalez, give it up. For City Council Position 9 candidate, Pat Murakami, give it up. Yeah. All right. Got lit a little bit there. Um, all right, so we're going to bring up what you all have been waiting for. The mayoral candidates, the Seattle mayoral candidates, if they can come up right now. I see them coming up, so that's why I'm pausing. But... Um, you can take either of the stairs and we'll get started. Enjoy. Hello. Great to see you. Hello. Happy Sunday. Well, welcome to the candidates for mayor. Carrie Moon. Where are the hot lights up here? <laughs> and Jenny Durkin. Please give them a round of applause of welcome, please. Here we go. So we got 25 minutes. You uh, have 90 seconds to answer each question. We'll give you two minutes each at the end to make a closing comment. And so here we go. First of all, um, what are you going to do to stop gentrification in Seattle? and particularly as it uh, moves south into the south end. How are you going to work with, for equity in housing in this city, but also particularly in this area? Let us begin alphabetical order. We'll start with Jenny Turk. Oh, I thought we were going to first names would be C. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> all right, well, we can flip it if you want. It doesn't matter. Go ahead. This is, uh, this is such an important issue because it has affected our city so rapidly. As growth has come, um, we have seen this city change almost overnight. Over 100,000 people have moved here in a very short period of years. And some of the greatest impacts have come in the Central District and Rainier Valley as, as so-called neighbors are gentrified, people are pushed out. And I think we have to have a very considered um, number of things we have to do to make sure the communities stay in place and that people can afford to be in Seattle. I want to take just one moment to acknowledge the gentleman in front who has been an avid supporter for veterans. And everywhere I go, I try to acknowledge that veterans themselves are sometimes a subject to some displacement and poverty and have not been treated well. So thank you, sir, for bringing that to my attention again. I think we have a really important duty to be thinking, how do we make Seattle more affordable? You know, it has become a city where people can't afford to live, and people who've lived here for, for many generations have been pushed out because property taxes have raised so much. So I would build more affordable housing as quickly as we can. I would keep affordable housing in place that is getting displaced through both incentives and supporting. But the most important thing that I hope we talk about later, Enrique, is economic empowerment. The number one thing we have to do to stop displacement is make sure that communities of color get a fair share of the economic prosperity which they have not had. It starts with good prenatal care. It means closing the opportunity gap. It means having apprenticeship programs and college tuition. It means real economic opportunity. Hi, thank you for coming out tonight. It is great to see folks so engaged civically and ready to help shape the future of our city. On this question specifically, I think we need to be doing a much better job of community-based planning in the South End. I met a woman last week who is a hairdresser in Beacon Hill. Her property taxes have risen so much that even though she's been in this neighborhood 40 years, she can't afford to stay and she can't afford to move. We absolutely have to solve this problem. I think doing community-based planning where we focus with the community about what kind of equitable development can benefit folks from the community is the right place to start. But that's easy enough to say. It's hard to pull off because it's so expensive to buy land in this community. So we all would love to have an El Centro de la Raza for every community throughout the South End. But until we can figure out the right mechanism for the city to help community groups own the land and get access to funding, we are not going to be able to achieve that vision. So the city needs to step up and help with access to funding, help with land procurement, and help build long-term ownership and wealth in the community. Because that 
long term is the only way we're going to solve this problem and get ahead of gentrification and displacement. So I am committed to work with the Office of Planning and Community Development to get these projects on track, get them in motion, get them the funding they need, and work directly with community groups on how to achieve community-based equitable development. All right. Uh, this question really is asking for more specifics. We're trying to build community wealth in the South End. What will you do to help, specifically, help community organizations compete against speculators so they can purchase a property, invest in the kind of projects that the people here want to see in the South End? We'll start with you, Carrie Moon. So this is tricky because we are in an economic climate where whoever has the most money wins. And we need to do something about this at the city level. I've talked a lot about speculation in the housing market where the rapid increase in our housing prices is not natural, it's not normal, it's not how a housing market is supposed to work. So in my first 100 days, I will hold a housing summit to really analyze what, is, what are the root factors causing this speculation and get the data and figure out the right disincentives to put in place to block the speculation and make these corporations and private equity funds go elsewhere with their money because our housing stock is, has got to be protected as housing for people who want to live and work here, not a commodity investment for the super wealthy elite financial global elite players. So we need to focus on that, but we also need to work specifically in the South End on the properties that community groups are trying to buy because it happens again and again where you think you have a project, you think you have a plan, you think you have a property, and somebody comes in from outside to take the property away just by offering a higher price. So the city needs to set up, I would say, community benefit agreements in advance when a project is getting assembled and make sure the city plays whatever role it can to block this from happening where speculators come in and take the land right out from under the community group. We need to find the right mechanism. I don't have the magic silver bullet right here, but we need to focus on solutions for this because right. we're, yeah. Thank you. Jenny, you're Jenny. We have some great models here in the South End. If you look at SEED, which was set up, it has done some good economic development, but we need to replicate that in a number of ways. Um, number one, we know that Sound Transit, when it came in here and as it's building out, there's various promises that have made a community that have never been delivered, particularly around transit-oriented development, to make sure that those spaces have both affordable housing, but also affordable commercial space, and that it's really part of the community where people can wike, walk and bike. Uh, the city has to enforce those agreements and work with Sound Transit to deliver a lot of that money that is, is allocated for economic development in the South End. The second thing is what I've talked about before, which is economic empowerment has to start sooner. So I proposed both a small business agenda and an education agenda that would deliver more economic empowerment to the South End. On the small business agenda, we know that a lot of the immigrant and refugee families are starting a family business. It is really hard for businesses to start these days because our B&O tax is so prohibitive because it's on gross, not net. I would give a three years uh, a vacation, if you want, for the first three years of a small business, they wouldn't have to pay B&O. So we could start those businesses in the South End and relieve them of the tax flow. I've promised that every graduate of a C Seattle public school will get two years free tuition to community college. That will give those kids opportunities they don't have today. There was a model, it's worked out to be very beneficial, and it is utilized mostly by students of color. So I think we really have to look at economic empowerment from, from the youngest age, through Thank the you. rest of the community. Thank you. Okay, this is a question from a community member in the Rainy Be Rainier Beach area. Uh, I'm a resident of this community. I was a young mom, and one of the things that was hard for me as a young parent was finding affordable daycare, and also qualified daycare, like a daycare center. I didn't feel comfortable leaving my child in a home daycare center. So when and how do we go about getting qualified day daycare centers in our area? Jenny Irkin. I think we have to try to build daycare centers into all the new developments we're doing as best we can. 
um, not just in the south end, but in the north end. For example, the University of Washington is going to be bringing on a lot of development. They should re be required to have child care there, so people who are commuting to work at the University of Washington have child care. Here in the south end, you have a terrific network of child care providers, but the state has made the system very difficult for them through heavy regulation and the like. We need to encourage as much as we can of that kind of child care in the homes and make it affordable for families. So I, I salute Lorena Gonzalez's work. She's also working on better benefits for childcare. I think the city has to be a full partner to make sure that mothers can work. One of the things that holds women back the most is not being able to afford childcare. I was fortunate that I could, but most families aren't in that position. So I think we have to work to develop more child care and have it located in the communities. And the best way to do that is through, for example, some of the Somali women have terrific child care facilities. But the state and the city have made it very difficult on them to continue. So we need to do that. We need to have more uh, language appropriate child care facilities as well, which is difficult to find. I think there can be a whole system of child care facilities that are, that are there, and then the city can have the, I proposed a domestic workers protection bill that would also apply to child care workers to make sure they're fully protected under the law. All right, Gary Moon. So I think when we set up our pre-K program in the city, we thought we knew what we wanted to do, but we treated it like a pilot, and it's a good thing we did because we've learned there's a lot of problems with it. So we have overly stringent requirements for how, uh, how to get to the certification level that the city requires. We probably need to adjust them. We have overly stringent requirements about the physical space that can be a childcare facility. We probably need to adjust that. And we didn't get the numbers quite right with how much to charge, how much subsidy to offer, and how to get the right, a healthy mix of kids and provide enough. So we have very few. We can learn from what we did in the first three years of this program. And when we go back next year to renew this levy, we need to get all the solutions in place to make this work better. And I would work directly with child care providers, make sure especially to reach out to the folks who were left out of this system, the ethnic and, and um, organizations and the folks who do child care in their home who have not been ha had access to this system and make sure we design the improvements. Rainer Beach, she's a senior at Rainer Beach High School. She says, what are your plans for people of color in the community who want to stay in this community? Because she's concerned. She's seeing a lot of other people come in. I'm not sure where we're supposed to go. I think she's talking about her community, an African-American community. Since the CD's gone, everywhere else is gone, and I'm not sure what else we have. We hear that a lot. It's Carrie, start with so you. So this is heartbreaking. We have basically let this city become a playground for the rich. We have not built enough affordable housing to people at low and middle incomes. We have let speculators invade our property market, drive up prices for their own benefit at the cost of everyone else. The city hasn't done much. The HALA program was a good start, but requiring you know, the developers to build that little affordable housing in new development is only going to get us 10% of the way to the solution. We need a lot more solutions in place to build affordable housing so that people who are creative people, people who are teachers and firefighters and physical therapists can afford to stay in the community where they work. We need to do a much better job. So I've talked about taxing speculation to disincentivize that activity. I've talked about getting a lot more money in the affordable housing pipeline for development of nonprofit affordable housing. I've talked about looking at the over 100 parcels of city-owned or public-owned surplus land that is sitting idle because we can't figure out how to do the property deal to get that land into productive use again as low-income housing, whether public or nonprofit. And we need to look at the missing middle. How can we support homeowners who want to add a second or third uh, a dwelling unit in their property, how can we support them in doing that? So we need to do all of these solutions together or we're going to continue to push out low-income people in this from the Thank city. Thank you. Jenny Dirk. I want to say to that senior in high school, if I'm mayor, at least you know you're going to get two years college. Um, because I really believe there's got to be both ends. We have to have more affordable housing. It's just not low-income people that are being pushed out of the city, though they're being pushed out most rapidly. 
the, the middle class people who work here can't afford to be in Seattle. So we need to build more affordable housing across the spectrum and in every part of the city. We need to push developers who are building housing to include in their buildings affordable housing, not just paying the fund. I think we also have to look at the other end of the spectrum. Again, I want to emphasize economic empowerment so that that senior today at Rainier Beach, I want her to be able to grow up and either own the business that's in the shiny new towers, or maybe she'll become a trade worker and build the buildings in the shiny new towers. But we have an economy that has become disjointed from our school system, and we are not preparing our kids for the jobs and the economic prosperity we're seeing grow. More and more of the talent is being imported. We don't need to do that. Our economy is changing rapidly. It will change even more rapidly. And Seattle has always been forward looking. We really need to connect the learning experience to the economy experience. But that's not much help for the people who are being pushed out today. It's a reason why I proposed rental vouchers for those people who need it today and can't wait for more housing to be built. So we have to look at the whole ecosystem, get more affordable housing, get more economic empowerment, and help the people who need it today. Why do you, why do you think past efforts to address the homelessness? You are out of line here. Um, this is not your event. You need to sit down, please, or you need to leave. Or you can go on interrupting each other for as long as you'd like. You need to leave. Goodbye, Alec. Goodbye. Have a nice Sunday. I think the 5 o'clock game is already underway, so you can go watch that. That's fun, Enya. Buenas noches. Ahí te vas. Okay, we need to move on now. You can join them too if you'd like to leave. We're, we're, we're gonna move on, you've interrupted this, and uh, you know, you're also interrupting other people that come here to listen to the candidates. Goodbye, have a good night. Good night, good night, yes. Yeah, thank you, okay. I'm sorry, Enrique, I didn't hear your question. Uh, let's move on, here we go. Here's the next question. Let's talk about homelessness. Why do you think past efforts to address the homeless issue in Seattle have failed? Uh, and do you think that there is a city out there right now that's actually getting it right or trying to, or close to getting it right? So what can you do to come up with some, some solutions that, that are actually, actually gonna make a difference? Jenny Durkin. I think it's failed because we've taken mo largely the, the wrong approaches. Number one, we treat it as if there is a one size fits all solution. The people that are tragically living on our streets and in our doorways and in their cars, they have different stories. They've ended up there for different reasons. It manifests itself in the same way, but they're different. And so we need to look, for example, before I ran for mayor, I didn't realize that we have one of the highest populations of moms with kids living in cars anywhere in the country. In a city that is so prosperous as ours, that's unacceptable. So we need to devise strategies to the people and their stories and the reasons they are on the streets. So for example, the mother with children, Mary's Place has developed some of the best strategies to get families off the streets and into permanent housing. The second thing we haven't done is shift ourselves to have more emergency shelter that is accessible. Um, we are a shelter system that is outdated. We also need more affordable housing, so we need the full range to have strategies to devise for the people and their stories to get more shelter that is accessible to people 24 seven, but we also need more affordable housing because people need a home. I will also say, I've said that I would not raise taxes until looking at what we have enough revenues to deal with. One area I may come back to voters on if mayor is in the area of addiction services and mental health. We simply have not addressed that problem in this city. It is connected to our homelessness problem and we have to deal with it. Thank you, Carrie Moon. So I would say we've failed to address the homelessness crisis because we are not looking at root causes. 
When in the 10 year plan to end homelessness, we never looked at why we are pushing people into homelessness faster than we're helping them out. It's because we are not offering at the state and county level sufficient mental health, behavioral health, and addiction services. We are 50th out of 50 for our mental health system, and it's a root cause of the problem. Second, we have a housing affordability crisis where a significant number of folks who are sleeping outside have jobs, but they can't afford housing at the rate that housing costs in this city. And third is that we have an economy that is generating such a higher quality, uh, sorry, a cost of living that even folks with a job can't afford to keep up. I met a family the other day where a mom and a daughter together make $1,200 a month. They pay $900 a month in housing. They are this close to being homeless. And she said, looked me in the eye and she said, we're counting on you. You have to solve this. So I think we need to get a lot more low barrier shelters, tiny house villages. 90% of the people sleeping outside would come inside if we offered them a place. We need to involve people who are experiencing homelessness in defining the solutions. They know what they need better than anybody, so the top-down approaches are not working. And finally, I think this is a big difference between my opponent and me. She has not said she would stop the sweeps, and she is against RV safe lots, and she is in favor of market-based solutions where we give vouchers to folks who are homeless to try to get housing on the private market, which simply doesn't work. We've seen it fail because housing is not Thank affordable. You. Thank you very much. Um, let's talk about uh, police. And do you believe that police brutality and excessive force, uh, force continues to be a major issue of concern in this city, even though we have a consent uh, degree uh, that we're under right now? And are we making the progress that we need to make? Let's start with uh, Jenny Dirk. Oh, I'm sorry. You go ahead. We're Pardon me. I got, well -trained in I got black knight. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you got me down. Here so, go. yes, it is still a problem. The Community Police Commission that raised this issue and the hard work being done throughout this, the city, city council, community police commission, the police department, the judge, are really important. We've made progress, but we are not there yet. We still have people on the street who are afraid to call the police because they don't know if they're gonna be better off taking care of their problem themselves or facing a biased police department. And so until we're done with that condition, we are not done solving this problem. So we need to keep going with anti-bias training, alternatives to use of force, de-escalation techniques. We need to keep going with, we need to implement 940 at the state level because that will be a key solution. All parts of it are incredibly important to implement at this state. In increasingly, the excuse me, the first aid and the investigation technique. Or I'm sorry, losing my train of thought. First aid to victims and investigation into any use of force. We absolutely have to keep going with that. And but we need to understand that the police force is representative of our racially biased system. This is not just in the police force. We've got to change the culture there, but we also have to change the culture higher up in city leadership to make sure we are guiding our police department to be the least violent, most skillful police department in this country. And that means training at all levels inside the police department, and it means oversight and empowerment of the Community Police Commission. Thank you. Jenny Durkin. I would say if there's any one issue that is critical in terms of what, what distinguishes me from Carrie Moon, it's this one. I have been working on this issue for decades. First as a criminal defense lawyer representing people who were arrested by the police and maltreated. Then on two oversight committees, including with Lorena Gonzalez and Pramila Jayapal, trying to correct police department uh, uh, activities. And then when I was U.S. attorney working with civil rights groups to get the consent decree. We saw video after video after video of usually young men of color being abused by the police, and then John T. Williams was shot dead in the street. The current, the mayor at that time was resisted any request for reform. We fought for a year and finally got the consent decree, which required us to have a de-escalation model to require that every police officer not just be trained, but they be trained in how they approach their community. We went in roughly the 70s and 80s from what was called a community policing model to a command and control model, which essentially not only authorized the police, but mandated that they treat people in that way. We have to change this. It's why I support I-940, because I don't think good policing should stop at the border. It should be consistent throughout this state. 
We've not gone far enough. The second thing I insisted on when I was U.S. Attorney was that it include biased policing. There was great resistance by the city because we had not been able to make a finding of that under our investigation. But it is clear that people of color are treated differently by the police throughout our country. It reflects the systemic problems we have and the issue of race in the criminal justice system. We have to keep working. Reform is never done. Okay. The, we well, need to leave it there. Sorry. Time. Thank you. Time. All right. Uh, where do you stand on safe injection, or in some cases, some call it safe consumption sites? Jenny I'm supportive of it, and I will tell you why. You know, people at first were surprised. They said, look, you were a federal prosecutor for a while. You worked with people who were, who were addicted when you were a criminal defense lawyer. Isn't this just enabling? And the answer is no. We have to have a harm reduction model for the opiate crisis. I was on the front lines on the war on drugs when it didn't work in the 90s, when we had a criminal justice response to people who had addiction problems. And so we have to take a different approach. We, we had the same battle or similar battle in the 80s and early 90s when we talked about needle exchange programs. And back then people said, you can't have that, it's condoning drug use, it's bad. It's worked, it's saved lives. But now we're in the situation where we have a raging opiate problem on our streets. We give people their safe needle, and then we say, go into the parks, go into your doorway, go into the cars. There's no park in Seattle you can walk in now where you don't see needles. We need to get people in a safe place so there can be a, uh, a nurse or other healthcare person there making sure that they don't overdose. But as importantly to me, what came out of the task force was the recommendation there also be the ability to hook them up with addiction treatment services. It may not take the first time or the second time or maybe even the 10th time, but the number one way we have to address harm reduction is to give these people the treatment they need. And I believe that if we have a safe place where people have healthcare supervision, safe needles, and the chance to get addiction services, it's our best chance to Thank helping you. them. All right, Carrie Moon. Yes, I'm also in favor of safe consumption sites with the same requirements. We have got to have medical personnel there to help, if anything goes wrong, help keep them safe. And we also have to have, to have addiction to treatment services right there, because when someone's ready to stop using and go into treatment, you've got to catch them at that moment. You can't tell them, come back in three weeks when we might have a space for you. So definitely yes, and I think the question becomes then how to implement this in a city, because neighborhoods can get fearful of it without knowing what it is. So let's look at the needle exchange model and look at what they've learned over the years for how to do this effectively. They have a commitment to clean up the neighborhood. They have a commitment to have you know, other measures in place to help keep the neighborhood safe. So let's make those commitments and let's have a really good dialogue in the communities where we are putting these in to make sure people can get the information they need, make sure they can understand what's happening inside, make sure they have a place to call and say, hey, this is not going well, we need cleanup, or we have a problem with safety. We need to really implement this well to make it work because that's, the, that's essential. We gotta do it the right the first time or we're gonna get pushed back from communities and not be able to do it again. But I would like to see these throughout the city, especially near where we have needle exchanges and make sure that we are building enough facility facilities, one is not enough. We're going to have to do a lot of them, five or ten, maybe even more. Thank you very much. All right. I tried to give us a little more time here since we had a few little disruptions. So we're going to uh, have our closing comments now. You each get two minutes, and Carrie Moon, we'll start with you first. So it's an honor to be here. I think this, these issues of equity are front and center in our community. I think through the last few years, especially with Black Lives Matter, Block the Bunker, Epic, and the Youth Jail opposition, we have understood that white people have to step up and join people of color who have been leading this charge for decades and build a city that is more committed to racial equity and tackling these problems of homelessness, of housing affordability, of increasing wealth inequality, especially between white people and communities of color and transit. We have got to focus on real solutions for these issues. I am an urban planner. I have 20 years of experience in this city working with city departments, city leadership, of elected officials, and community groups on developing solutions collaboratively. This is the kind of leadership we need in the mayor's office because these problems of urban growth and of equity 
are not easy to solve. You can't come in from a different career as a lawyer and a prosecuting attorney and just expect to know the answers. We need deep expertise, we need ethics and transparency in the mayor's office, and we need a collaborative approach with city staff and the mayor's office and council, with community groups to tackle these problems together. That's the only way we're going to get ahead of these problems. We know what path we're on. We know we are becoming a playground for the rich. We know we have people who have been denied access to power for too long in this city. So I am proposing we have a different kind of leadership where we really share power across race and class and gender, where we have more transparency and an action agenda that we can all understand for where our city is headed, and we have really skillful people ready to implement in the mayor's office and in city departments, because we know we can be the best city in the country that's truly committed to the well-being of everyone, that's truly committed to sharing prosperity, but we need leadership to get there. Thank you. Jenny Dirk. I want to thank everyone for being here, too, and it's great to be in the neighborhood. I want to just show of hands, how many people in this room are ready to roll up their sleeves and make this a better city any way you can. See, this is the silver lining of Donald Trump. I will tell you, I have been in rooms throughout the city, big and small, and the good news is people are showing up. They want to know what kind of city are we going to be and how do we help. And I think this election is not about who's going to be mayor for four years. This election is about what will Seattle be like for the next generation. We are literally rebuilding our city before our eyes. We are facing those issues that are being faced across the country, but in such a palpable way. We see wage disparities just by driving across our city. We see people being pushed out, and we see the city changing, changing every day so that people can't afford to be here. We have the ability to change that. We have the ability to tackle climate and transportation wage disparities, and we have the ability to have honest conversations about racism and race in our society. And if we do that here, we can show the nation how it's done. Because there is nothing good coming out of the other Washington for the foreseeable future. The good's going to come from here. The good is in this room. And I believe that if you elect me your mayor, I want to work with community. I want it to come, the solutions to come from the community, and that we're all going to have to pull together. We can't, we can't replicate the divisions in Washington, D.C. if we want to move forward. We have to have honest conversations, passionate conversations, but then we've got to move on with solutions. And I believe we can do it. I believe that if we work, we can get more affordable housing quickly. We can make a difference in the homelessness crisis, and we can make this city the city of the future that has tackled issues like climate, that has wonderful transit, and every part of our city is welcome to every kind of person. That's the Thank Seattle you. I want. Give it, get it up for both candidates. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see people are leaving, and just for consistency's sake, I do want to do a final round of applause. So, give it up if you love the answers of candidate Jenny Durkin. And give it up if you love the candidate Carrie Moon. All right, that wraps it up. I want to give one more round of applause for the executive committee who you know, uh, spent nights and days planning this. So if you can raise your hand and let's give them a round of applause. And thank you so much, Enrique. You rock. All right, thanks, everybody. Thank you. How about a hand for Enrique? <laughs> thank you. How about a hand for my dad? <laughs>